All right. Good morning. Welcome today. Good to see you here. Yeah. Two claps and one yay. That's awesome. <laughs> That's okay. I'm not expecting anything. Just glad you're here today after Easter, your post-Easter experience. Thank you, guys. Some of you got the post-Easter blues. <laughs> I won't step on your shoes. It's okay. Uh, man, we, I'm telling you, I don't brag on you guys enough. What a great day. Uh, you guys hit a home run last week. We had over 570 people in worship last Sunday. So that, that's exciting. That's like pre-COVID stuff. So awesome. Uh, we haven't hit that in a while. We had over 114 kids in our children's area. And so I'm starting to think, okay, it's a good thing we did the addition now. I was getting worried there for a while, but uh, the Lord is filling that up. Now, here's the deal with Easter. It shows you what you're capable of as a church. And so you guys invited, uh, you brought people. Uh, we just had a really great Sunday. What a great celebration, celebrating the risen Lord Jesus Christ uh, that we celebrate week after week after week, but especially emphasize at Easter time. What a great time. And just appreciate you guys for the work you did. A lot of you guys did a lot of work uh, putting in to making that work. Uh, there's nothing like the energy of a, a Easter egg hunt on steroids. And so that's what we had last week. So that was fun. And our, our uh, Lord's Supper communion time that we had together was great. So just a great Sunday. It, it was awesome. Uh, I had one of the best times I've ever had uh, with you guys. And so that was fun. Uh, and I really did enjoy that. But we're, we're on our series. We started this series called The Cross of Christ, which was probably my favorite. Oh, my gosh. Uh, my favorite subject to preach to you about at any time is, is the idea of what happened to us, uh, what Jesus has done on our behalf, and when we come in this relationship with him, uh, how that begins to change us and, and how he forgives us and how he loves us. Uh, and, uh, you know, how he begins to, to disciple us and work us b towards being more like the people that he wants us to be. And so we talked a little bit about the idea of justification, uh, that whenever you come to that relationship with Christ, he begins to see you just as if you had never sinned. And uh, what a great, uh, you know, doctrine of the cross that is when we talk about justification. Such a deep thought. Uh, and then today I want to talk to you about something called reconciliation. It's kind of along the same line. Uh, it, it's another doctrine, great doctrine of the cross. Uh, what does it really mean to be reconciled in Jesus? Because sometimes I think that God's people forget what it means to be reconciled the way that God has reconciled us. And sometimes we struggle for I, our identity. We struggle to know who we are. We struggle to understand how loved we are. We struggle to understand how accepted we are when we're fully and completely accepted by Jesus after we place our faith in him believe in him, receive him, uh, make Jesus our savior, however you want to say that. The Bible says it a lot of different ways. But whenever that happens, there's a change that comes inside of us, and it's a change that's called reconciliation. It's one of many changes that happens. And so I want us to take just kind of a deep dive look in what it means to be reconciled by Jesus, okay? Because you, if you're a believer, have been reconciled by Christ. The scripture says this in Colossians chapter 1, uh, verse 21 and verse 22, because this kind of gives us a real capsule uh, viewpoint of, you know, it's all like wrapped up in one big package right here, what reconciliation is all about. And it says this, and it's, it says, and although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil activities, okay, this is the way you were before you came to Jesus, it says, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Is that not cool? What an amazing uh, verse that is. Once you were hostile towards God, once you were alienated toward God, to, towards God, this is like the capsule form 
of what it really means to be reconciled. This is reconciliation in cliff notes, okay? Right there for you where you can really see it. Once you were alienated, once you were hostile towards God, you lived against God. Uh, you lived, uh, it says, actually engaging in evil deeds in your life. But now that Jesus has come into your life, come into your heart, now you have changed that. Now you've been saved, you've been born again, you've accepted Christ, you received Jesus. And the scripture says, you have been reconciled. What a great word. The word reconciled means that you owe nothing. You had a debt that was against you. Your debt has been paid. The debt has been taken away. You don't owe anything anymore. Nothing can be held against you. Therefore, you stand in front of God, debt-free, holding nothing against you, fully acceptable, received into the presence of God. Is that not cool? And so that's what happens whenever our sins are forgiven, whenever we ask Christ into our heart and he begins to change us, okay? He, he changes the very essence of who we are. The idea is that we owe to sin debt because uh, the scripture tells us that all men sin and fall short of what God's glorious idea is for the life, okay? And so we owe this great sin debt. I mean, it's almost like we owe like a million dollars worth of sin to the Lord that we can't pay. And Jesus goes and dies on the cross and is resurrected from, from the dead and stands beside the Father. And it's as if he takes all the money that we owe. And let's say we owed a million dollars. Jesus takes a million dollars or a million dollars worth of righteousness. He takes a million dollars worth of righteousness and he places it in our account and we no longer owe against that. Isn't that cool? He balances the scale. We used to owe this, but now he's paid it. But not only does the Bible says that he's paid that, but he's reconciled us so much that he put so much righteousness in our bank account that even when I sin from this point forward in my life, there's enough righteousness there to cover any debt that I might build up beyond now. Isn't that cool? And so he saves us in this uh, relationship that now we have with him. He has now reconciled us. He set us free. We don't owe anything. He, we're reconciled. He's reconciled you in his flesh by his body that went to the cross and that was broken and the blood that was shed for you. It reconciled you. Jesus paid the price. He paid everything that needs to be paid for you to not owe anything. Do you feel a weight lifted off of you? Your debt is gone. You don't carry it anymore. It's taken off of you. And so he's lifted that off of us in order that he might do what? The Bible said, the scripture said there, in order that he might present you. He's now reconciled you, fleshly blood, through death in order to present you. He wants to present you uh, uh, somewhere. It's past tense. It's the idea, he's already done this. He's already presented you, okay? He has saved you in order to present you, and he's already presented you. He's presented you before him holy and blameless. Can you imagine that? That God presents you holy, blameless, and beyond reproach. How could God do that? Isn't that awesome? That's the kind of relationship and connection that you have with God now, that he can present you holy. We sang the song earlier about holiness. Uh, what a great song we can see. I love just singing that song together. And so we talk about this holy state, this blameless state, this state beyond reproach. The doctrine of, of, of reconciliation tells you that you're totally and fully accepted by God and all your debt has been paid. Isn't that cool? And so we celebrate. Yeah, that's great stuff. And so we celebrate that together in the Lord, okay? Now, does that mean necessarily, Pastor, are you telling me that God accepts everything I do? No, he doesn't. You see, God didn't necessarily save all of your performance. He saved your soul. He saved you. He saved the real you. He saved the spirit you. But sometimes that old nature, because we don't just kind of, we're not just sucked out of our skin whenever we accept Christ. Sometimes that old nature sticks around and sometimes we become a spiritual Jekyll and Hyde. And so the Lord always doesn't accept everything that I do, but he always accepts my person because he saved our person. He saved our spirit. He saved the real you that's going to last forever. And so as a believer, sometimes we become a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, you know, or Mr. Hyde and Dr. Jekyll. I don't know how that works. But anyway, we, we become that. And so that sometimes the good comes out and sometimes there's some bad that might, that might come out. So does God always accept our bad performance? No, he does not. God can accept that. And, and so, you know, should we be loving and acceptable to everybody 
that we see that comes into our church? Absolutely, we should be. We should be loving and acceptable to everyone. But we don't always accept the performance of everyone because the scripture says that God's people cannot, that God cannot accept that that is alienated, that is hostile, that that's against God. And so anytime there's something hostile against God, we stand up against that. We say, no, the Bible says no to that. Do we accept all people? Yes, we do. Do we accept the things that they do? No, we don't. We don't accept them. We don't approve of it. We don't applaud it. And we don't. We just accept the things that God tells us to accept. And so it's just really important for us to kind of, kind of, kind of know that idea that whenever you're reconciled, uh, your personhood has been reconciled to Christ, but not necessarily your flesh, okay? So it causes a little bit of struggle to be there. So God doesn't always accept our performance. Sometimes our performance is not what God wants, and so God turns that away. But he always accepts our personhood because he saved us, he's reconciled us, and so we're fully and totally acceptable to God in who we are. And so as believers, we begin to live in that in Christ. You've been reconciled blameless through Christ. He, he presents you blameless. He presents you beyond reproach. He presents you holy. And so when you, have, when you accept Christ, he sees you holy and blameless and beyond, uh, beyond reproach. And so uh, just because I blow it, now, as a believer in my performance does not mean that I'll blow it in my personhood, okay? Because I'm fully acceptable to God. And so, since my body didn't get really fully reconciled, your body has not been reconciled. Your body is going to die. It's not going to leave this earth, okay? It's going to stay here. Uh, it's going to go into the grave. It's going to uh, be, I don't know, spread ashes over the bay at uh, Port Lavaca or something. I don't know, Okay. All right, that body's going to stay here. The body, the body isn't saved. The body is not reconciled. The body stays here. And that's kind of why we still have this struggle, okay? But your inside, the real you, the spirit you has been reconciled, and it's going to be going to heaven to live with Christ with ever because uh, the real you is blameless before God. It's above reproach before God. Uh, it, it's held holy before God. And so as a believer, God sees you, your personhood, as holy. Can you believe that? That word that's most often used to describe God in the Bible, that word that actually means to, to have perfect, pure, uh, um, transparency, transparency that's most often used about the pureness of God, that whenever you get saved and accept Christ as your personal Savior, that's the word that God uses to describe you, that you're holy. I mean, that's shocking. That's unbelievable but, but that, that the Lord would forgive me of all my sin and that he would see me in this state of holiness. And who would believe that, that I would be considered purely transparent and honest before God? Who would ever dream that that could happen? God considers you holy and you can't get more acceptable than being holy before God. God sees you beyond reproach. That means that there's nothing you can do to make yourself unacceptable to God. That means that you're completely acceptable to his presence and, and he accepts you. He doesn't accept your performance. No, sometimes your performance stink, okay? Sometimes our performance is bad. God doesn't always accept that. Sometimes we do things that are considered wrong and sin to God, okay? But he does accept who we are. He does accept our personhood, okay? Now, as, as uh, kind of my personality has always been, even as a pastor, I love to take things and to improve them, okay? And when, when I look at our church, I'm, I'm always thinking, well, we can improve this. Oh, we could get better with that. Our worship could be better this way. Uh, I think we could reach more people. I'm, I'm always trying to find a way to make the children's better, uh, Holly, to make the out front greeters better. You know, I'm always thinking of ways that, that we can do that. That's just in my blood. Uh, I've got that from my mom, and, I, and I'm always trying to to improve and make things. So, so here's what happens to me. This really messes me up theologically because what I tend to do is, even though I have this relationship with Christ, it's a perfect relationship with Christ because he's accepted me and he's reconciled me, I tend to always want to do something to make that better. Is there anything I can do to make my salvation with Jesus better? No. There's, I'm always trying to improve on it. I can't improve on that. How do you improve on this... Uh, this, uh, you know, this salvation experience that God has given us through his perfect son, Jesus, going to cross to die for our sin and receive him. There's nothing I can do to make that better. God did it all through Jesus. And it's through grace, by faith, 
that I receive that and I begin to live that. And so you've been reconciled, fully acceptable through Christ. You're fully acceptable. The scripture says this in Jude chapter 1, uh, verse 24. It says, now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. God causes us through Jesus to stand in his presence, blameless with great joy. In the presence of God, we're blameless with great joy when we're believers in Christ. I think that we just forget to celebrate that sometime. I think we forget to take in the greatness of what God did through Jesus for our lives in the act on Easter of going to the cross and dying for us. We can never celebrate that enough. We can never over-celebrate what God has done for us, the salvation that he's brought to us, sinful man. He's brought us salvation if we just believe in Christ. And he receives us and he accepts us. And we've been reconciled fully acceptable through Christ. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 16 says this. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws upon upon their heart and on their mind I will write them. And then says and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Isn't that cool? That when you come into this relationship with Christ, he doesn't remember your sin or your lawless deeds anymore. They're wiped away. He wipes our sin away because we've been fully accepted by Jesus because we've been what the scripture calls reconciled through Christ. We just forget what it means sometimes. We forget how accepted we really are. Did you know, uh, you know, we're always afraid. I don't don't know about you, but I run into people all the time that they're afraid. I'm afraid if people knew some of the things that I've done in my life, they might not really accept me for who I am. Have you ever had that fear? People tend to have this fear a lot. I'm afraid if people really knew some of the stuff that I've done in my past they wouldn't accept me. People tend to think God will not accept them. I run into guys, I run into born again believers that come in and will tell me, Pastor, this time I've done something I don't think God could ever forgive me of this. There's no way. Did you know that nothing could be further from the truth than that? The reality is that God forgives our sin if we simply ask him to forgive us of our sin. And if we accept him as our savior, he fully accepts us Uh, accepts who we are. He takes us in, forgives us us of our sin, and moves it away from us as far as the east is from the west. We just forget how forgiven we are sometime. Okay? Because God, when we accept him as our savior, he reconciles our personhood, and there's nothing we can do that would make us unacceptable to God. Now, our performance can be unacceptable, But we can never be unacceptable because our relationship with God is not about a performance. It's about a relationship. It's not about what we do or have done or will do. It's about what he has done for us on the cross. He has saved us from our sin. He has reconciled us. And so now we can never be unacceptable to God. Now, some of you might say, well, pastor, don't you think that'll make us prideful? I mean, I, in my opinion, I don't think you can ever feel too good about yourself, okay? You can feel too bad about yourself, but I don't think you can feel, if you're saved in Christ, I don't think you can really ever feel too good about yourself, okay? And some people say, well, Pastor, don't you think that'll make us prideful? No, no, no. Pride comes when you feel too good about your performance. Pride comes when you feel, you feel too good about the stuff that you do and the things that you accomplish. That's where pride comes in. You see, in Christ, there is no pride because we don't take pride upon our performance. We take pride in our personhood of being a believer and accepting Jesus and walking in Christ. That's different. That's a, that's a total different concept, okay? And so pride, thinks in, pride comes from thinking too good of your performance, not thinking too good of yourself. If you're a believer, you're fully accepted by God. And God saved you and he's, he's made you acceptable and you can always walk into his presence. And, and, and I ask people like this. Let's say if, if Jesus has saved you, if you've received him as your personal savior, he's forgiven you of your sins. 
is there anything you can do to get more saved? There's not. Why? You didn't do anything to get saved in the first place. It was, what? By grace, through faith, that Christ saved you. So you can switch that around. Okay, so if there's nothing you can do to get more saved, is there anything you can do to get less saved? No. Well, I didn't do anything to get saved in the first place. How can I do something to get less safe. We get all messed up and worried about our performance sometimes. Our performance stinks a lot of times, okay? It's, it's, the good thing is I'm not saved based on my performance. I'm saved based on my person because I've given my person to Christ and he has reconciled my person to be totally and fully accepted by him. I just think we forget it sometimes. I, I, I think we begin to struggle with who we are individually because we don't, we don't really remember the fact that there's nothing I can do to get more saved. If there was, then Jesus went to the cross in vain. If you could do something to make yourself saved, then Jesus wasted his time. He wasted his life. Jesus' last words were what? It is finished. His last words were, oh, it is almost finished, or it might be finished. What were they? It is finished. I did everything it takes on the cross. I died for your sin. It's over. The battle's been won. The victory is yours. You can receive it. You've overcome death. You've been reconciled through Christ. It's done. It's over. Nothing else could be done better or more fully than what Jesus did on the cross when he died on the cross, when he was resurrected from the dead. And now he lives beside the Father or sets beside the Father as in, and he speaks on our behalf before the Father. And now we walk right into the presence of God with all the fullness and the holiness of Jesus placed on our life, all of his righteousness because we have been reconciled through Christ. You've been reconciled to freely Completely live your life for Jesus. The scripture says this. It says, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but live for him who died for them and was raised again. So now we live for Christ who died for us. And we freely get to do that. If you've been truly reconciled, you freely now are set free to live for Christ. Uh, and, and so you, you might be saying, well, well, pastor, why do we do all the stuff that we do for Christ if we've been fully reconciled and it doesn't matter anymore? I mean, why, why do we pray and why do we read our Bible and why do we show up for church and why do we be compassionate and loving to other people and why do we serve God and you know why do I work in a children's area oh my gosh I don't know why do I work in a nursery uh, because there must be great sin in your life I don't know working in a nursery is rough right okay and, you know why do we do all this stuff pastor uh, you know if, if, if it really doesn't matter all that much then why do we do this because the love of God compels us because what he's done for us uh, his act of mercy on our behalf sending the son or going to the cross Jesus to die for us and God sending his son that all compels us so much that I want to serve him I want to follow him I want to live for him I want to give everything for him it's the least I can do for Christ he did it for me and so I freely get to give that back to him. What a joy God has given me in order to serve and believe and to walk and to be what he wants me to be. What a great, powerful thing comes into our life. I'm um, right now in my, my own personal life, my mother's not doing very good. Mom is elderly. She's in the hospital. I'm having a drive to Corpus a couple times a week, three times this week. Uh, to be with her. And uh, in fact, this week on Thursday, I had an experience where I'm with, I'm with my mom and my two sisters. I kind of give them a break and, and they went. So I was at the hospital with my mom and uh, they brought the, the, the hospital brought down the meal for her for lunch and they set the meal down on the tray and then they walked out and they closed the door and it's just me and mom, okay? So I look at the tray I look at mom. I was like, all right, mom, I'm going to have to feed you. 
And I've never done that before. And I'm not sure I know how to do it, but mom, I think we can get through this together. And she says, yeah, we can get it together. You can do it. And so I had to sit there and I had to basically just feed mom. Uh, I've never done that before. I've never ever had to take care of her. She's always taken care of me. Was I willing to do that? You bet your life. Why? I owe her a bunch. Honestly, I literally wouldn't be here without her, right? Yeah. So much love and so much care she's given me for all these years. What a great mother she's been. Man, I wanted to serve her. I wanted to feed her. She sacrificed half of her life for me. You see, Jesus went to the cross and he died for us. He reconciled us. He fully reconciled our person. Our performance stinks, but he, he, he took care of us, okay? And he's taking care of us eternally. And someday I'll receive a new body and someday I'll come into the full reconciliation that he wants me to have. And sometimes an old nature will quit stinking so much, okay? And when that day comes, we'll have a great celebration. But the least I could do is live for him. The least I could do is try to follow him. The least I could do is try to live the way that he wants me to live. The least I could do is be the person that he wants me to be. I just think we forget sometimes what he's done for us on a cross. And as believers, we're always trying to find our identity. How do I identify? Who am I? What am I about? Where is my value? You should, as a believer, find your identity in Jesus. That's where our identity lies. We're identified as believers in Christ. We're identified as justified by Christ. We're identified as reconciled by Christ. And so we should get our self-worth based on our relationship with Jesus. And in Jesus, we're fully accepted. So we should feel good about who we are because we're the children of God and we're walking in a relationship with the Father and He sees us holy and He sees us blameless and He sees us beyond reproach. Isn't that cool? And so we get our identity from that. It begins to change the way we live. It begins to change the way we see life. It begins to change who we are. And we become fully accepted living the way that Jesus wants us to live. And he went to the cross and died so that could happen. What a great word, reconciliation. What a great verse we find in Colossians chapter 1, verse 21 and 22, that we've been fully accepted by Christ and we need to live in the fullness of that. Let's bow our heads together for a time of prayer, if you would. With your heads bowed and maybe your eyes closed, let's just reflect a little bit about your life. Where is it that you get your full identity? Do you get it in Jesus? Do you remember that as a believer, God has fully reconciled you? And I don't know, maybe there's someone here today that's never been reconciled, that's never really believed in Jesus, has never had their sin debt taken away. The reality is, if you will just ask God to come into your life, to come into your heart, to forgive you of your sin, the reality is that you can live reconciled between you and God fully. But you just have to believe it. You just have to accept it. And sometimes I think as believers that have already made that commitment or decision, we just forget about the forgiveness and acceptance that we have in Christ. And we start trying to get our identity from all different areas and places in our life. And then we begin to get confused about what identity might even be. We need to turn that over to Jesus. And we need to fully accept what he's done for us and believe it and walk in it and live in it. And just trust it. Trust your life to the Lord. Just give it to Him. And so if you're struggling with that, I'm just praying today that you'll just fully turn that over to God. Maybe there's areas of your life you need to ask forgiveness for. Just so you can really get right back into that relationship. Maybe there's something that's hindering that relationship from being what God wants it to be. And maybe you have to confess that to the Lord ask Him to forgive that. Just do that today. I'm going to give you just a second to do that. Make it your prayer right now. I'll give you just a second to do that. All right, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for today. 
We thank you for your message. We thank you for Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. We thank you for reconciliation. And we thank you for Jesus, our Savior, who made that possible. And God, we receive, we receive the fullness of what you've done for us in Jesus and help us to live that out in the way you want us to live it out. If there's anybody here today, God, that hasn't received it, I pray that they just will right now. And I pray that they will believe and I pray that they will begin a journey of walking with you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your message today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you guys for being here today.